All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We're in a different classroom, but none, uh, but that doesn't matter really. Um, so we're gonna talk about the nitrogen cycle. Um, it's gonna be one of the most important cycles that you encounter uh, because nitrogen is one of the most important nutrients that we apply to our plants. Um, just to look at some of the nitrogen sources that we'll be using for crop production. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> some of the ones y'all may be the most familiar with is urea. Um, we have some ammonium sulfate and some of these in solutions that are becoming a little more popular. Uh, we can't get ammonium nitrate much anymore. Um, and then we have these uh, about 23% uh, that we'll get from, let's say, um, uh, poultry manure or uh, some other manure type of source or some kind of organic material. Um, so in class, we kind of went over the nitrogen cycle, and I'm going to cover that a little bit more in depth. Um, there's a lot going on here, but if we take it step by step, uh, we'll be able to kind of walk through this and have a better understanding of all these transformations that are going to happen when we apply fertilizer to our soils. Uh, so many of us are well aware about, you know, 79% of the Earth's atmosphere being dinitrogen, uh, but it's most important as, um, as being center to this chlorophyll molecule. And so if we don't have any nitrogen, uh, then we don't have chlorophyll. And if we don't have chlorophyll, we don't have photosynthesis. And so this is the reason why when we apply nitrogen fertilizer, then we start to see this green up. So when we apply nitrogen, our chlorophyll um, concentration is increasing and therefore we're increasing photosynthesis and we're getting, we're absorbing more of the uh, red and blue, purple and violet indigo uh, portions of that light spectrum and reflecting the green. So that's why when we apply fertilizer, uh, we have this uh, green up is what it's called. Uh, important to know the two plants available forms, ammonium and nitrate. Well, if it's not in these two plants available forms, there must be some conversion or some transformation uh, that allows our plants to be able to take that up. Uh, sources are going to be organic and inorganic, so our um, organic matter, uh, those big large carbon molecules, uh, are going to contain nitrogen somewhere in them. And when our microbes decompose those uh, organic structures, some nitrogen will be released. But it's likely to be in, it's likely to be released as an organic form of nitrogen and must undergo uh, mineralization into an organic, inorganic form. So plants take up inorganic, microbes use organic. So the biggest question to ask is what is the fate of this nitrogen in the environment? Um, I think pretty much everybody here has had uh, at least me for soils. I know uh, Madison's had me for soil fertility and her stomach just turned when she heard me ask that question. Um, but if you just think about kind of going through the nitrogen cycle in order, it's not really that difficult. So first is going to be fixation. And so when we um, plant something like a legume, like a soybean or maybe a cover crop that is a legume, we have to inoculate the uh, seed with this uh, Brady, Brady rhizobium that is going to form this symbiotic relationship with the plant and fix atmospheric nitrogen. Next, it will undergo mineralization. And mineralization is the transformation from organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen. You might be able to think about that as min, organic to inorganic. And within that mineralization, uh, there, we'll see this in the uh, nitrogen cycle when we go through it, but within that mineralization process, one of those sub-processes is going to be ammonification, and that's how we get our organic nitrogen uh, in a plant-available form such as ammonium. Uh, once it becomes ammonium, it can undergo nitrification or it can be taken up by the plant. I was 
wasn't necessarily real crazy about the way that the book kind of outlined these transformations and these processes, uh, but just to keep it kind of simple, I just went in order with the numbers of the uh, indicators on that nitrogen cycle. Also, I posted that nitrogen cycle uh, in iLearn so that you can get some practice on filling this out and where everything goes and kind of uh, make some notes on it if you'd like um, and you know just practice on how to fill this nitrogen cycle out which you will have to do for the exam. Next we have immobilization. Immobilization is inorganic nitrogen back to organic nitrogen and so you can think about I inorganic to organic. Mineralization, plant uptake, and immobilization are going to be central to pretty much every nutrient cycle that you do. Um, not that there are a lot of them, uh, we're mostly concerned with N, P, and K, um, and sulfur. Next, this nitrate can be leached because the overall net charge on soils is negative. And so nitrate is in anion it has a negative charge and so two negatives do not attract each other so because the net charge is negative the nitrate is not adsorbed to the soil colloids and it has a greater potential to leach <clears throat> kind of going the other way um, if you recall from soils I mentioned about this um, that these clay layers can expand and potassium will be fixed inside those inner layers well, ammonium and potassium are fairly this kind of the same size. Um, so if we have this clay layer that gets wet and expands and we have a greater ammonium concentration, the ammonium can then be kind of substituted for that potassium. And when the, when the uh, soil dries, it gets trapped in between those clay layers. Um, so you might have applied your fertilizer and it just so happens that you have a soil type that has this two to one clay fixation potential and the plants can't get to it because it's trapped in between those inner layers. And then finally we have a couple of gaseous losses to the environment, um, volatilization and denitrification. Um, volatilization is probably going to be the most important one for when you go to apply your fertilizer. Uh, but uh, denitrification is probably the most, uh, um, causes the most problems in the environment uh, because the, one of the byproducts of denit, let me take that back. The end byproduct of denitrification should be into gas because this is going to complete this whole cycle from atmosphere, soil and plant back to the atmosphere. But uh, given the right conditions or the um, maybe not so right conditions, uh, we can release this gas, this N2O di um, dinitrous oxide into the environment and it has a global warming potential 300 times greater than carbon dioxide. And since we're so worried about this carbon dioxide uh, and this uh, climate change and the impacts of that on global warming or however you'd like to hear that, um, we have to watch out for this and so these these nitrous oxide emissions um, are something that agriculture is scrutinized heavily over um, not so much the volatilization uh, the volatilization really kind of hurts the producer more than it does the environment but again we are losing something back to the environment so i don't know we kind of go up and down about that um, as far as uh, what the environmental impact of ammonia volatilization because it becomes a gas and it gets oxidized and eventually it will turn back to N2. But it's not in the soil and if it's not in the soil it's not in the crop and that's where we need our fertilizer. Okay so we have this atmospheric fixation uh, not really to go too much on that uh, but we are concerned with this mineralization that kind of have a mobilization in there too because I particularly see those two as one separate thing. But just in keeping with the, the way this is numbered, uh, we're going to go through it step by step, one through nine. So number one, we have atmospheric fixation. Uh, plants fix into gas from the atmosphere and then turn it into an inorganic form of nitrogen for our legumes to use. Uh, so for our organic matter and our decomposing plants, 
uh, things of that nature. Uh, we have these amines, which are uh, kind of part of the amino acids that eventually turn into uh, protein structures. And protein is what builds, like in humans, protein is what builds muscle. Well, much like that in plants, protein is what gives the plant its growth. So uh, we undergo this aminization where we have this or, in, um, organic compound, this R indicates organic, uh, and it will undergo a process of mineralization through ammonification. Now we have a plant available form of nitrogen that can be adsorbed to the soil. It's a cation. So if we can keep it as ammonium, then we can keep it in the soil. And if it's in the soil, the plant has a better opportunity uh, to take that up into its tissues and perform that photosynthesis. So remember, mineralization, organic to inorganic. Uh, there's like a two-step process to that. Um, aminization and then ammonification. And then once it becomes ammonium, uh, there are several fates that can happen to it. It is likely to undergo de um, nitrification to be taken up by the plant, or it's possible that the microbes will immobilize it. So there's this back and forth between immobilization and mineralization based on the microbial needs um, and the carbon residues uh, that are in the soil. Um, one other uh, instance of ammonification, and this will be uh, probably more applicable, uh, something that humans actually have an impact on, is <coughs> excuse me, urea hydrolysis. And so here's our urea molecule, and we apply that as a fertilizer, a granular urea, and we require water to convert that ammonia, I mean this urea molecule to ammonium carbonate. And then from ammonium carbonate, it will be converted to two ammoniums, and the byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. Well, this carbon dioxide is likely to be given off as a gas, and this water, well, it's really kind of like a very small molecule of water that is in the soil. So I want y'all to think about something. Um, if we have a, if our pH is low, then our hydrogen concentration is High. So at, in more acidic soils, we would expect to have a greater hydrogen concentration. So um, when we're thinking about this kind of urea hydrolysis process, we're not really thinking about like a soil sample or this big field. Uh, we're really thinking about this micro environment. So you have this very small prill of, I mean, I don't know, let's, you ever seen, well, if, if you've used urea, then you know that it's just kind of like a little small ball of fertilizer, but very small, like little bitty ball of fertilizer. Um, so wherever that fertilizer lands, you have to think about the micro environment that is right there. So if you have this fertilizer and this is the bottom of the prill, we're talking really about just the, just only the, the soil that touches the bottom of that prill. So if we have an acidic soil, we will take two hydrogens from that concentration, which will make the pH in this little area of this prill become more alkaline. And that's why I tend not to use acidic or alkaline. Uh, technically it's one way or the other. You're either becoming more alkaline or you're becoming more acidic. Is this something that we could measure in a pH meter? No. Is it something that would show up on a pH test? No, but to understand that in this very small micro environment that this fertilizer and this transformation is influencing the pH right around this very small region at the bottom of that prill. So we are taking two hydrogens from the soil and converting that into two ammoniums, carbon dioxide and water. Um, not so much that you'll need to know these, um, how to do these chemical equations for this class. Um, a couple of y'all are graduating, a couple of you have already had um, 
soil fertility, but this is the type of stuff that we go over in depth in soil fertility. So once we have ammonium, it can be converted into nitrate. First it will undergo nitrification to nitrite. Excuse me. Nitrite is toxic to plants, so we need this conversion to happen very quickly to nitrate. And so nitrate is a plant available form. And this process looks something like this. So here we have our um, ammoniums from the previous problem, uh, or from a couple of previous slides, and we have this oxygen, right? And so we have oxygen uh, and this nitrous ammonia species. So nitrous ammonia is responsible for kind of catalyzing uh, this reaction from ammonium to nitrite. Remember, we said that nitrite is toxic to plants. So we need the nitrobacter species to, con to quickly convert this nitrite to nitrate. So nitrous ammonis is ammonium to nitrite. Nitrobacter is nitrite to nitrate. And what I was telling my, um, uh, on my soils class is you can think we have N-I-T-R-A-T-E. So nitrobacter, we have an A in there, so it's a nitrate. And nitrosomonas, ammonia, nitrosomo. I don't know if that helps y'all, um, but it kind of did for me when I was taking this class. And look, here are our three oxygens. There's our three oxygens. And one of the byproducts of that is going to be four more hydrogens. What do you expect the pH of the soil to become? More acidic or more alkaline based on releasing these four hydrogens into the soil? It would become more acidic. So back here, it became more alkaline because we removed two from the soil. During this process, we're releasing four back to the soil. 